morning again. A quick um, housekeeping note, there are some seats available in kind of our bird's nest up there too, so if anybody's brave and wants to climb our spiral staircase, we've already had one taker, so it's not too long to get there. <laughs> yes, sir. You'll send them to everybody? Uh, I'll put them on <laughs> Great question. And Natasha and Matt, if I could convince you to come forward, our first victims today. So as I mentioned, um, this morning we're going to start off with the point of view of the buyers. So, uh, very exciting. And then after that, we're going to hear about the point of view of the banker. Um, and I think appropriately, this is the right group to get us um, kicked off this morning because we would love to hear, I think, from a startup perspective, um, on the corporate side, how does all of this go down? So how are companies being purchased? How were they found in the first place? What are they doing right to get the attention of folks like that we have here on stage? Um, what are some common snags they get into? How do you negotiate more? That great stuff. So we're going to kind of raise the curtain on that. So I'd love if you both introduce yourself um, quickly, and then we'll get into the questions. Hello. Right. So I'm Natasha Pigai. I'm a lot of that. We have a we have a very small uh, M&A team. I've been in tech for um, almost nine years. So, um, it, I mean, obviously, it's been, it's been great. And we are responsible for M&A investments. Um, uh, we have some business development. Good morning, everyone. My name is Matt. Um, I actually don't represent Cisco Corp yet. I just work very closely with them. Uh, I joined Cisco about four and a half years ago through the acquisition of a startup called Collaborate.com, which is my source of the investor in, um, and I was founder and CEO there. Um, uh, it was a pretty interesting process to go through some of the company at Cisco because I didn't know what to expect or how to approach it, and a lot of what I can share sort of my learning journey through that. But for perspective, Cisco is probably the largest acquirer of uh, technology companies in the world. Uh, there's a dedicated team for <coughs> that like, just get so many people you think all they do all day long is buy their company. What number do you think? It's 140 companies, <laughs> full time employees who do nothing but shop for. Buy, integrate. Um, so we probably do between two and five deals a quarter. Um, it is very much a machine and uh, has a very particular role view. And, and I'll stop by saying um, how each company does MA is very different. So, how, as you think about going into an MA deal, pay a lot of attention to the unique reality of that organization um, because what Cisco does is entirely different than what Amazon does. Natasha, I think you the same thing about your team. It's different across every company and organization. And how many people, just out of curiosity, are at Watch Tech from a BD perspective? Um, uh, from a BD perspective, we have, so we organize, I don't know if those familiar with Watch Tech, we actually have uh, business groups. We have uh, two books in the corporation, gaming, music, um, home, and then uh, we have kind of creativity, productivity, business that is more around um, the traditionally mice and keyboards, but it's also expanding the audio. Uh, so in nature, those business groups we usually have a pretty well person. But um, I would say for new initiatives, something where we venture into the development and the new markets, how we And again, I have a team of people, including myself. So and we do sourcing, we do some business development. Cool. All right, well, startups in the room are going to love this question. Um, how do you find your targets? And maybe Natasha, this is a great question for you to start with. And Matt, you can probably share that from all the companies you work with through the founder stuff and how they're discovered. Um, I actually feel like in terms of finding startups, we feel like for our spaces or our relevant spaces, we actually have a pretty good visibility because we look at um, we look at all of them so it's not like this um, then we 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 keep we do like this almost by the view of Kickstarter in the world just to understand what, what companies are launching on those platforms. We get enormous amounts of um, inbounds on LinkedIn for all of our team leaders and all CEO, and they're very good about just forwarding it to us. <laughs> Please take a look. Um, and then on top of that, we keep in touch with all of the VCs at the investor community. So I think we have a pretty good uh, program where each one of us has a you know, good relationship with a number of those companies. 
And then I feel like we probably talk to five or seven students in a startup space um, each, you know, per week. And then, um, and then we obviously get involved in the option process and other major um, startups. So you are, that's actually interesting, you are looking at people on Kickstarter. So you're just like everybody else, seeing products that they're still seeing, yeah. checking out what's new, seeing what's successful. Yeah. 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 So we just completed one of the half staff companies that have to share models. So they had to start thinking about the company. So um, that was one of the ones we've seen on Kickstarter. And then we've seen the microphone here. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry, I was talking about Rebels, it's one of the hacks portfolio companies. We saw it on Kickstarter, a couple of people from business groups as well as how we saw it's a very interesting solution. So we reached out and we kept the central company for two years. You know, oftentimes when it doesn't happen, it's like you might be you reach out. So we've actually kept the central company for two years and we've just continued that. And I want to, I also just a note on um, the cold call. I get a lot of questions for teams. Is it worth us sending a random note? You know, XYZ for LinkedIn or for email. I have their email address or something shared with me. Uh, is it ever worth it from your perspective? Uh, it's probably cultural. Like some, I, I'm not sure how it's done in every company, but in our company, I would say, at least from what I see from the peers now CEO, they respond to every email. And honestly, sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, we'll leave this email. Like, this is just like some, some random, uh, you know, some random. Uh, Random person like with, like I invented a foot mouse, you know. But um, but we, we are actually very good at responding, and then our team obviously makes an effort because we want to preserve like what what either the team leader or CEO wants to make sure that these relationships are like we do take the calls. At the minimum, we take the calls with the other. That's really reassuring. I already started to remember a deep breath of yeah. a moment. We have a foot mouse. So I always tell this story. So after I sold uh, Collaborate to Cisco, uh, which was seed finance, which was a local maximum, I had a lot of entrepreneurs come to me and say, hey, I want to sell my company. Can you tell me how to do it? Like, oh, yeah, sure, of course. <laughs> and I said, so first thing you need to do is, who have you built relationships over the past two years to buy your company? They say, well, nobody. They go, oh, we'll start now, and in two years, you might have some conversations. Then. And they go, but I don't have two years. They say, well, then I can right? Because in our world, MA is often treated like this lottery. Like, you're busy hacking away on your thing, and the phone rings, and some fairy godmother comes in and says, we'd like to buy your startup. Let me tell you, that does not happen. Or if it does happen, you can't play it. So it's a really bad strategy. So Cisco, for perspective's sake, is about 75,000 employees, about 55,000 full-time contractors, over 300,000 people in our partner network who are 100% compensated on Cisco sales. So when you talk about Cisco, it's a, it's a social organism of about 400,000 people. Now, according to that budget, I don't know the budget, but picture it between four and five billion dollars. But it's not like four or five billion dollars of funny money that's sitting around. It's actually funded by the businesses. So we have a collaboration business, we have a core networking business, we have a security business, we have a data center business. Those groups set aside budget dollars to buy things. Okay? So if you want to get bought by Cisco, build great working relationships with people in the lives of business. Right? And generally that takes about two years to do at a minimum. From like first contact to like you seem kind of smart to let's get together to have you thought about this to make a reference where you build up to the point where you go, you know what, we're behind in this area or this is an area that's important to us or we missed the boat here or we can't hire fast enough. What are we going to do? And someone in the room says, I know a guy. Right? I know a girl. And, and it's this company like this and I bet we could get them for about this much. And then you know what they say? They go, well, we already have a deal with the pipeline, sorry. And that's it, that's the end of that whole conversation, because they only do one thing at a time, right? Or they say, oh yeah, that sounds about right, we have room, we one of those 140 people in corporate debt, and they go, we already are just with five people, come back to us in three months, because only then can we, the debt interest, we just don't have anybody available, right? And, and so, you know, the, the inner workings of the corporate organism are actually pretty pedestrian, right? It's all relationship-based, it's all trust-based, and you need someone in your line of business who's going to be pounding the table on your back. Okay. So ask yourself right now, who do you know in your network who has access to a deep 
uh, M&A budget who would be willing to pound the table on your back. And if the answer is nobody, which is generally the case for early stage startups, my advice is start now. Start now. So Matt, that's going to lead to a very tactical question and I'm looking at for all my startup friends in the room here. How do they find someone like yourself or someone like Natasha? Where does that first contact point take place? You know, to me, it's, it's like, uh, uh, and this is an overused analogy, but it's like dating. And if you're like, hi, I like you, let's get married, it's a big turn off, right? And so generally, you want to start small, you want to start slow, you want to start the confidence building, right? And you want to think through what on the other end would, would, would make that person have confidence and trust in me. So generally, a great way to meet people is at conferences. It's one of the very few times you can meet people randomly at social from the few times you can go up, like whenever I go to conferences, the number one thing I do is wait at the front of the stage to talk to the speaker when they go. Because generally it's the only time I'll ever get to them. I've met amazing people that way, right? And, and just like a little side note, I met Cheryl Sandberg that way, you know, when Facebook was on the way up. She is like rock solid one on one. And I emailed her and she responded within like eight hours, right? And if Cheryl Sandberg can do that, then damn well you can do it too, right? So, anyways, um, that's my advice. It's all about relationship. It's all about building credibility. Right? So anyway. And that's interesting because that kind of speaks back to the same process as raising money, right? So if you see exactly the same way, the relationship building, starting early, being likable. <coughs> we always make all of our teams read how to be friends and influence people at least once, preferably five times over the course of a few years, because those are really helpful tactics. To... Uh, no, I mean I think this is like the example of giving you like like I'm thinking the acquisition we have and it's all been a it's all been uh, not necessarily a relationship building, but it has been supporting for at least a year. You know, it, 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 when we talk about it internally as well, it's, it takes time to develop the thesis and the, strat and the strategy internally for the acquired startup, and also it takes time to for the startup sometimes to get comfortable with where they're going. Uh, sometimes we want to see them grow the technology a little bit more, and we kind of stay close. Them for a year or two before they're ready to buy. So I think it does take time to do an acquisition, especially in the years. And in terms of uh, finding people, I mean, that's, 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 that is true. And I think, um, I don't want to be disclosing too, too much about a specific process, but it is true. Like sometimes, like I've become an advocate for a lot of the startups we were looking at for two years. And um, there was a person who just didn't believe in the, in the segment and really didn't want to support it. So it really took me like to include other people in the process, whether it's a head of engineering uh, in the in the related area, or maybe it's a new person who came into this space to to you know, develop a business. So it's like you almost, from our perspective internally, I, I almost feel like I have to bring in additional people to make sure that this business is thoroughly reviewed and supported. Because if there's a if there isn't that advocate internally, then it's very hard to get the up because. Even if our CEO likes it, if there's no, not a business leader who's going to say, I'm going to take it out of my way, and I'm going to grow it, I'm going to integrate it, and I believe in this, this strategy, then it's not going to Two things to add. It's always better to be bought than sold. Big difference. Big difference. And, and again, that should be something really clear in your head. Like, are you looking to buy a car right now, or are you looking to be sold a car? Right? I have a car to sell you. You're like, I'm not interested. I don't care about your car, I don't care about the price, I don't care how great it is, I don't care about you. I'm not interested in being sold, right? Versus, I'm in the market for a car. Right? So, for you guys, think about how might you get bought? Why would you be bought? What about you is being bought? And we in technology like to think about the code, and it's often not, it's often less about the code than you might expect. And the code brings with it all sorts of liabilities to the mind too, but it's as much about the people as it is about the product. It's as much about the business as it is about the concept, right? So it's, all, it's about all of those things. But we tend to over-rotate on, check out the value of my technology. And most acquirers sort of are pretty grounded on how long it would take them to build that, and how much it would cost them to build that, and why they want to pay up for your version of their code versus their version of their code. I like that better keep off the sold. remember that. Mm -hmm. um, so thinking through uh, triggers, we Natasha, you kind of touched on this a little bit after, you know, if there's a couple of your process and you meet um, a great person in corp dev at a conference or talk to somebody when they get off the stage, you start that relationship, maybe you have a few in-person meetings, maybe you continue to keep that contact person updated 
ask for advice, give them updates on how you use their advice, that sort of thing. Um, let's say that 18 months, two years has passed, and it kind of gets to the point where there's an opening for that type of deal, you're looking for that technology. What kind of triggers that moment of when the call becomes, this is a, this is a buy call, we're interested in kind of taking this to the next step? Uh, you mean from it internally? Yeah, yeah internally. Because, I mean, there's always, obviously, when we kept in touch with the company, there's probably always some sort of interest in what either technology or the team or the business. So um, I guess, you know, we keep in touch with companies in case they're like on the verge of growth and we're now seeing kind of, it, it's ready to be part of us versus being independent. But sometimes that you grow better and develop better independently. So it's, it's maybe that stage where you're kind of hitting an inflection point and you get the right money or you feel like you know it's coming and you really need to expand um, and you need the resources. Uh, I mean, I guess that's one reason why companies, like for example, in the case of Rumble, they fully developed the product and they were ready to go mass production. So for them at that point was, do we raise money? And they haven't raised money before. Do we raise money and actually then, you know, try to mass produce in our own? Or do we actually sell because we own most of the company and then, you know, and then actually produce for somebody else within a large company? Um, and it could be, you know, financing is oftentimes actually a trigger for us because for us, like once the company raises financing, it becomes very expensive for us to buy. So we, you know, we're not a large company, we're not Cisco, so we try to stay very disciplined about valuations. So um, when, when it's a business we really like and it's about to raise financing, we know the valuation is going to triple, I don't know, quadruple. So that's the time we really sit down and think, do we buy this and prevent them raising financing and make, you know, actually then the founders will walk away with more cash than they do post financing. So I think that's, that's a good that's a one. And, and sometimes just the strong factors. If we're ready to the market, we need technology and we we're scrambling to find that part that we need. So it's to happen. And just to draw a little bit of that, tactically, how would you know that's happening? Is that the founders keeping you updated through emails, through kind of meetings yeah. every few months? Exactly. And I think that's, uh, I mean, I feel, I mean, Matt was, uh, Matt was referring to the fact that you have to stay in touch with the, with the companies, but I feel like from our end, it's also our responsibility to stay in touch with the startups we're interested in, to make sure we know when that happens. Because if we have known of a startup that was somewhat interested, interesting and they raised financing and we did not know about it, that's a failure. So we also have to make sure that it's the mysterious what happens behind the closed doors exactly. of the corporate. <laughs> yeah. okay. is financings are great forcing functions in both directions, because if you're about to close financing, it makes you more expensive for the potential acquirer. It also dilutes you as a founder. So typically, like a great time to get acquired is just as you're running out of your seat. Because you basically have enough dollars to build something real, you have maximum equity, and the acquiring company can acquire for relatively small money, but it can be life-changing for you as inside. Right? And then you go and you raise the next round of funding, and you're going to take 18 to 24 months to get back to the same equivalent value that you are just prior to that. Right? So what tends to happen from the founder's perspective is their local maximum. Right? Where you say, hey, right now is a pretty good time. Because we can we built something that's valuable and it's gonna be great for all of us inside. It's not gonna be headline making news, right? It's not gonna be a gajillion dollar deal, chances are. But you know what? It's gonna be a, a big notch in your gun and it's gonna be a, a big success to get to on the next level. Actually, yeah, I'll say that.